Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. And uh, thanks for having me here. It's such a wonderful event and so interdisciplinary. And I'm looking forward to all the talks here. So today I'll talk about what is the path towards realizing embodied intelligence. That is the mind and the body coming together. We say there's a healthy mind in a healthy body, right? But so far, a lot of progress has been the mind and the body being separate. The mind is the AI, the body is the robots, are the robots. And we've designed them pretty separate until this point. And this talk will cover challenges on how to bring them together. So if you look at even the state of art robots today, like the Boston Dynamics uh, Atlas robot, it can do a lot of impressive moves. You know, it can like jump, it can do like, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, even a backflip. It can do it pretty precisely. But then does it have the intelligence of uh, our favorite animal, the dog? The answer is no. Right, because the dog can fumble, it can miss the jump, but still it's far more intelligent than our best robots. And that's because intelligence is about the ability to learn new skills, you know, to take data, to learn, adapt to new environments. And the dog is amazing at doing that compared to our best robots. So how do we get to this path of embodied intelligence. If we look at the path that AI has taken over the last decade, it is bringing together three important ingredients. I call this trinity of AI. You know, we have not just the algorithms. You know, if you think of AI, mostly you think of the algorithms, right? But the other two facets are equally, if not more important. And that's the data and the compute infrastructure. All these three came together in a fantastic way over this last decade to create the deep learning revolution. You know, we launched the ImageNet challenge in 2009, and for the first time, there is this enormous label data set available for researchers to work on. And that's when we could see the power of neural networks. You know, the flexibility that neural networks offered meant that you could learn the features from data itself rather than humans having to hand engineer features. And now that we had enough data, we could learn them using neural network frameworks. And the third important facet was the compute infrastructure. GPUs or graphics processing units manufactured by NVIDIA have been at the forefront of this deep learning revolution. And that's because of their ability to parallelize these computations. So the same operations that were applicable for graphics, high performance computing, were also applicable for AI. And that's because the neural networks have matrix computations that underlie the same foundation as other algorithms. So this parallelism enabled us to run these large-scale networks uh, where you could have as much as a billion operations per second. And so you had all these three ingredients come together. Lots of labeled data, flexible neural networks, and parallelism of GPUs. So now that we have the deep learning revolution underway, the next natural question is how do we get to embodied AI? How do we put the mind and the body together? So let's start with how these three ingredients play together when it comes to embodied intelligence. If we now think about computational requirements of some of the autonomous machine operations and applications, uh, they can be quite enormous. That's because we are now thinking of applications that can involve video analytics, that can involve aerial inspection, and that can involve delivery bots. And for this, we have rich information. We can have videos, 
sounds, text, sensors, all this data coming together. And processing this is not going to be cheap. And a bigger challenge is having to process this sometimes on device. You cannot always rely on the cloud, and the bandwidth requirements to get to the cloud can also be enormous. Right? So how do we do more edge computing? That's a challenge. And that's where the NVIDIA Jetson AGX Xavier platform has made a leap. It's the first AI computer for autonomous machines. And some of the applications I just mentioned are now possible thanks to this platform. So this is the first step, and we need to still design algorithms that can do edge computing at scale, that can do this to conserve batteries, that can conserve bandwidth, and that can find this right balance between the edge and the cloud. So that's where the next challenges are going to lie in terms of computation. So the second facet are the uh, data, right? What kinds of data can we expect for embodied intelligence? Unlike standard deep learning where it's one given task and one kind of data, it's going to be quite different when it comes to embodied intelligence. We can have multimodal data meaning data from many different sensors and many different data types. And uh, we can have many different tasks and requirements. And hence, we require a more general form of intelligence, you know, multitask, multimodal, multi-objective type of intelligence. And to do this, we require the ability to take in all this data of different forms, all these objectives of different forms into our neural network architectures. That's where I'll see the role of tensors being in the forefront. So what are tensors? Tensors are extensions of matrices to higher order operations. So far, much of the neural network architectures have focused on matrix operations. Now, that's the foundation of our linear algebra, and that's the foundation of how we compute in these neural networks. But as we get this rich multimodal information, tensors to represent this rich data, as well as process them through the layers of the network, will become more important. And we are designing some of these tensorized neural networks where across the layers, instead of matrix operations, we are designing these higher order tensor operations. And these networks can be much more powerful in taking in multimodal data, in giving us compressed networks that can be put on these edge devices that can be more robust and generalized better, which is important for robotics. So this is where you see the data and the algorithm design coming together for embodied intelligence. The other aspect of deep learning that's not uh, um, you know, nice for robotics is the requirement for large data sets, right? So when it comes to physical robots, it's going to be very expensive to collect data. And hence, we cannot do a purely data-driven black box approach. We need to marry deep learning with priors, with our knowledge of physics, with our knowledge of domains. We can't start from scratch. And so a lot of algorithm design is how to blend the two together. Because there'll be parts that we already know, and there'll be parts that'll be learned from data. In one application, what we did was to look at a model-based control approach. So we already know the Newton's laws of physics. Now, we don't need to learn that from data. But then there are some forces that are hard to model directly. If you think about drones, aerodynamics is not something that's easy to model. So we learn that from data, but the rest of it is model-based control. Right? So we can blend the two together to get best of both the worlds. And so with some uh, amount of data, what we can do is improve the landing of drones. We call this the neural lander. And what you see 
is smoother and more graceful landing compared to the baseline. Hence, we can combine uh, model-based control and deep learning together. That is data-driven approach with prior information. So another aspect is designing uh, useful environments to collect data. So we have this wind testing facility at Caltech where we can program different kinds of wind conditions and collect precise data with which we can then use deep learning algorithms to make drones robust to different wind conditions. So we need to bring all these aspects together to overcome the scarcity of data when it comes to robotics. Another principle is to think about the use of simulations. We may not always have real data. Can we simulate that? And simulations are not going to be perfect. Can we then have algorithms that can expect deviations when the robots run in the real world? That's where the NVIDIA Isaac platform enables us to do this seamlessly. For instance, uh, this is the kitchen robot in the NVIDIA lab in Seattle where we can many manipulation tasks. For instance, the robot needs to grasp different objects. It needs to open and close drawers and so on. And to do this in simulation, we can now generate different kinds of cabinet models, right? Because the robot can adapt to different conditions. And then we can use the parallelism of GPUs to run these simulations at scale. So you can do a lot more in simulation. And then we can transfer it to the real world and think about algorithms that go from sim to real, simulations to the real world. So this is where, again, we have new algorithm design to take into account that there are going to be domain shifts when you go from simulations to the real world. So I showed you different ways to overcome the data scarcity uh, in embodied intelligence. And that's through the use of um, tensorized architectures that can take into account multimodality in data, the use of prior knowledge to augment black box deep learning, and then the use of simulations to augment the real data. And these are just some of the challenges when it comes to thinking about intelligence. I think there are far more than I can cover in the short talk. But a few ingredients that we still don't have good answers to are notions such as instinct. You know, humans are very instinctive. They know what to pick up in this huge mound of information. They're deliberative. They make short-term and long-term plans very well, at least in many cases. You know, we are social beings. We have social awareness. We interact with other human beings and animals. How do we have, create that awareness in our robots? How do we get them to coordinate as well as compete in an intelligent way? And lastly, how do we get them to be behavioral? How do we get them to understand humans and enable human-machine collaboration? Because a lot of tasks will not be completely autonomous, but will be human in the loop um, systems. So how do we enable all this is still a very open question. And we've incorporated some of these challenges in what we call moonshots at Caltech. We have the Center for Autonomous Systems, or CAST, um, at Caltech, where we are thinking of five different kinds of robotics moonshots. There are explorers, there are guardians, transformers, transporters, and partners. So explorers are robots that will explore not only our planet, but potentially also uh, other planets and uh, systems uh, in our universe. And for that, we need them to be instinctive. You know, we are born explorers. How do we build that into our machines? We need them to be our guardians. In case of disasters, how can we have deliberative robots that can quickly make plans and also adapt them to save human lives? We have transformers that uh, need to uh, you know, swarm and coordinate across different uh, uh, agents together in order to 
uh, you know, build and transform existing environments. Transporters that can deliver different packages or even save lives. Uh, flying ambulance is a project we are undertaking at Caltech on how quickly we can have transportation systems that can save human lives. And then lastly, partners that will partner with us together. You know, human exoskeletons, entertainers, chatbots, these are all ways that, you know, we'll, we'll have seamless, you know, interaction and integration with human bodies and minds together. So I see a bright future as we undertake these moonshots at Caltech and bring together embodied intelligence. Thank you.